Line it with walls that are concrete filled. Oh dear, that's more oh. It was a weekend of thrills and some unusual spills. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call a control tyre. Two weeks ago, Canberra's GMC 400 lived up to its reputation as the Coliseum of Carnage. But through it all came Stephen Johnson, Junior's first Shell Series win and an historic 100th championship victory for Ford. Stephen Johnson is going to win the round overall. Falcon's second win in succession proves the Blue Oval is a force to be feared. But Scape and Bright's consistency has already tightened HRT's grip on yet another Shell Series crown. Now it's time to give the wheel guns a rest because we're going sprint racing in the Wild West. Round six of the Shell Championship Series from Barbagallo Raceway WA. Exclusive to your home of motorsports, Network 10. Welcome to the West. Today we're at Wanneroo, 35 k's north of Perth at Barbagallo Raceway for round six of the Shell Championship Series. And there's a bunch of questions to answer. Four of the last five visits here to Western Australia, Craig Lowndes has been the boss, but this year he's changed brands and teams. Can he continue to be an influence? Rumours persist that we may not be coming back to Wanneroo. This could be the last visit. And if we come back next year, it may be through the streets of Perth in an entirely different event. And after today's round, we'll have reached the halfway point of the championship. And so far, it's been all Holden Racing Team. Let's have a look at the point situation after Canberra. Mark Scaife with a 14-point margin over Jason Bright. Then Stephen Johnson, Russell Ingle, Marcus Ambrose, Stephen Richards, Greg Murphy, Glenn Seaton, Todd Kelly and Craig Lowndes just inside the top ten. Well, today marks the first time in the championship this year that we'll return to the old format. There's only two events this year in the 13-round championship that are sprint race formats, which means we've got three 20-minute races. No compulsory pit stop, which means it's just a full-on brawl to the chequered flag. And it means that qualifying is ultra important and yesterday we saw a fabulous qualifying session and in turn a great shootout in fact at one point after pure qualifying there was just three tenths of a second covering the top 10 competitors it's the first time that the control tire that we now use has been used in Wanneroo it was introduced last year after this round so in practice people were slipping off the road and the battle at the top of the order was just quite extraordinary people like Russell Ingle and Craig Lowndes in actual fact had to use both sets of allocated tires just to get into the shootout but here's the order and it was Paul Radisich who did a stunning lap an all Ford front row then Paul Morris the first of the Holdens Russell Ingle Mark Scaife Larry Perkins Craig Lowndes I mentioned had to use his two sets of tyres just to get in there then Greg Murphy his teammate Todd Kelly and Jason Bright but certainly the outstanding name within the top ten yesterday and the very best of the Holdens was Paul Morris he's with Mark well, we know Big Kev gets pretty excited about a lot of things, but I reckon right now he'd be thrilled to bits about the performance of his driver, Paul Morris. The best qualifying performance so far in the Shell Championship Series for the Big Kev Racing Team. Third fastest, Paul. I think even that surprised you. Yeah, very exciting for me and the team, and uh, we're a little bit surprised, but our hard work's paying off. I guess a lot of people at home would, wouldn't understand just how hard it is getting one of these cars into the zone. The level of competition out there, you've got 12 test days a year. That's a hard task. It is, you know, we've got 12 guys on our team and every one of those has got to do their job absolutely right and when you do it you sort of can finish up the front and qualifying and hopefully in the races. Now we've got three 20, 20 minute races this weekend on one of the, the toughest circuits in the country. How are your eight tyres looking before we start? They're in pretty good nick. We've done uh, two laps on each set so we're in good shape as far as tyres go. Inside of the second row for the start. There's no pit stops here to do any leapfrogging so I guess the start's going to be critical too. Yeah and uh, I think um, inside row is not too bad. I'd hate to be on the outside. Uh, I think third's a bit better than second round here. How are you blokes looking toward the end of the year? I reckon you're going to be pretty strong by the time you get to the endurance races. Yeah, having said that, you know, it's um, it can all turn the other way pretty quickly, but we'll just keep working away with our program. We've got a new car coming online, hopefully by Iron Park, and if we can be fast up there, it'll be great. And I believe Matt Neal, your co-driver from last year, may be joining you. Yeah, we hope to have him in the uh, second car at Iron Park. Well, best of luck this weekend. Thanks, Mark. 
So a strong performance from Paul Morris. We'll watch for him in today's three races. In Canberra, as you may recall, it was the first time that we'd introduced not only a new pit lane speed limit of 40 k's, but also an electronic speed limiter. And it was interesting, after the three rounds there, we had eight people in total that infringed the pit lane speed limit one way or another. And people have asked me since that event, how can that be with the button on the steering wheel? I just wanted to make the point before today's races, even though it doesn't involve compulsory pit stops, there's still a human element. The drivers can arrive too quick and literally break the speed limit as they cross the line. They can pull their finger off the button too quick and launch out of the pit lane too fast. Of course, also when they come out of their allocated bay, they can launch out too quick. And I heard that one or two of them just simply forgot to push the right button. So some issues arising out of Canberra. The other thing that's been interesting is the resurgence of Ford. And I think we're now seeing the full benefits of the under tray package that was allocated to the brand last year. And in the last couple of rounds, Ford have taken the round win in Darwin and in Canberra. And one of the outstanding names has been Marcus Ambrose. He's signed a long-term contract now with the Ford Motor Company, and he's with Barry. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Well, I'm down here with Marcus. Now, Marcus, what happened in Canberra? The, the output shaft broke once. And then how did you keep losing the wheels all the time? Oh, mate, it was just a shock of a weekend, you know. We had so much speed, and we didn't get a result, you know. It's one of those weekends that was destined to be a, just a hard weekend for us. We lost the input shaft. It was, the, it was a development part and uh, we thought we had plenty of time left on it before we changed it but we didn't and it broke and uh, and then on the, the last race with the wheels we lost three wheels just a small mistake and then uh, you know they just kept falling off it was like monty pythons wasn't it the last one <laughs> but that was so funny i was sitting in the car watching you roll down the hill and i thought it won't it won't it, it's gonna it won't and i thought it might have taken out someone here and then i sort of pop up on the tire well, i just couldn't believe it you know, i just shook my head and jumped out so, so what about here? You were, seem to have been struggling, and so why is that? Yeah, we're basically, we, you know, we're on six cylinders, and uh, V6 doesn't go as good as a V8, does it? So that the, it's just motor-wise, what about handling and stuff? No, no problem with the car at all, you know. This is a very strange place, it's, it's extremely abrasive, and yet when you're driving around it, it's just got no grip, and it's almost like driving the rain. Mm -hmm. And I put a new set of tyres on there for qualifying and just the difference was amazing. It was maybe 1.5, one, 1 1.6 seconds, you know, and on a short circuit it's a lot of time. And so I'm learning again, you know, like um, I had to really try and go faster in each corner and I'd, I'd finish the lap and I thought I just could have gone so much faster than that. But, you know, but then the engine came back on the six cylinders and, you know, it's just a bit of a shocker. So you're having a great year so far. Yeah, OK, a bit of bad luck in camera. Good year, though. You've got to be happy. Oh, it's just been the best year. The best year of my racing life, you know. I've just got such a great got bunch of guys to work with. You know, we're learning as well as a, as a team. We're gelling and, and uh, working out what goes and what doesn't. And I'm just so pleased to be here, you know. I've been across in Europe and I've you know, had a bit of a hard time over there and, and really ground myself into a bit of a hole. And I've come back here and I've risen. And it's just great. What a great feeling. Yeah, doing good. Yeah, it's brilliant. Thanks, Thanks, Baz. You picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel, Marcus Ambrose might say. Stay with us. You're on Network 10, your home of motorsport. We're coming back shortly with round six of the Shell Championship Series. What's the cost of carnage in this super competitive Shell Championship? Well, many teams battled to make it here to Perth after Canberra two weeks ago when many cars were substantially damaged. Well, let's take a look at the shopping list built up by David Bernard in the wake of the Canberra street breaks. The rookie damaged four front bars, one bonnet around the right-hand side of the car, two front guards were replaced. Every door was replaced at least once over the weekend. A grand total of six wheels were damaged. Now that little bill there totals $6,000. Right rear quarter panel was also replaced. Two wing mounts at the back of the car. A boot lid was replaced and three rear bumpers. Now making this task of fixing this car that much tougher, the team only had four days to rebuild the car before the transporter had to set sail to Western Australia. The boys had a bit of a job on their hand and um... They're all quite good about it, surprisingly, but the problem with Canberra, if you have a bad weekend there, you can, you can do a lot of carnage. You have a good weekend there, you usually end up with a bit of carnage. And in my case, it was uh, a bit worse than a bad weekend. Ross, I've got to ask you, were you surprised at the level of carnage at Canberra? Of course, uh, you ended up with a very big job on your hands. Yeah, it was a big job, but David made it easy for us because we had a lot of places to start working on the car. It wasn't just like it was just at the front, it was sort of just about every area. So we just started in each corner and worked, worked towards the centre. 
<laughs> well, damage is always an issue and it's likely to be again this weekend with the tight format and the cars being so close. Ross is being pretty cagey there. You probably tear up the best part of $30,000, $35,000 with that kind of damage, so it can certainly make for a difficult situation for the team. Well, let's have a closer look at where we're running this weekend at Barbagallo Raceway in Perth. And as I said before, we are 35 kilometres north of the city. It's a beautiful day and it's a beautiful layout here. It's a tricky little circuit. You can see it up there to the north of Scarborough. It is seven turns, 2.41 kilometres. Craig Lowndes, as I mentioned before, has been the boss of this location for the last five years. Mark Scaife has the best qualifying record with a stunning 56.9. They're not getting near to those times now with a different tyre from when we've raced here in the past. But for a closer look, let's go for the ultimate backseat ride with our good friend Greg Murphy with the Kmart Inside Line. Thanks, Neil. Welcome aboard the Kmart Racer for a lap of Barbagallo, the place that's surrounded by sand. And uh, for a circuit that's got such an abrasive surface, you'd think it had a lot of grip, but with the sand around here, uh, it gets on the circuit and makes this place very slippery. We're going up through the uh, S section here, which is quite quite tricky. You've got to be very careful because you're hard on the brakes now into the sweeper, which is taking around third gear, accelerating out of here. You can see all the sand on the outs outside of the circuit. This is a bit tricky. A lot of cars put a wheel off on that side, dragging a lot of dirt on. This is one of probably the uh, best passing opportunities down here into the into this uh, sweet position here a lot of cars go underneath passing under brakes through that section accelerating out it's very very tricky as we accelerate all the way up to sixth gear you've got to be very careful on the throttle through that section and not to get too much wheel spin otherwise you do uh, lose some speed and it compromises you down into braking in the shell down here the last corner it's a very short circuit but provides plenty of entertainment lots of uh, action going on here as you come through the last corner onto the front straight again it seems like it's only taken a few seconds but that's 57 58 seconds for a lap thanks for coming aboard the kmart car this today thanks a lot well, the man with the ultimate inside line at Barbagallo Raceway is Paul Radisich. Three times he's taken provisional pole, but hasn't been able to nail it in the single car shootouts. He's finally done it at Barbagallo. Paul, what a brilliant lap. Thanks, Mark. If everything went really well. I mean, uh, maybe I learned something from Canberra just to, uh, to back off a little bit and not push 10 tenths. And uh, I guess I was pretty close, but, uh, you know, it's great to complete it. And uh, it's good for, good for the team, good for uh, self-confidence. And uh, particularly around this track, it is so difficult to pass that uh, if you can start on the front, you know, you, you're reducing your workload by um, 90%. How are your eight tyres looking for the three races today? Well, at the moment they're looking good. We've only done one lap on each set, and um, this is the first time we've run these this type of Bridgestone tyre around here, so we don't know how far it's going to go before anything happens, and um, it's just a matter of conserving them, and uh, if the tyres are good, which I'm sure they will be, um, towards the end of the race, then um, you know that, that's going to be the key to, uh, to the success around here. Best of luck. Thanks. And Paul looking to make amends for that qualifying faux pas in Canberra. He starts from pole position. Now, because of the time difference here in the West, we actually had a race yesterday, the first of these three sprint races. So after the break, we're going to take a look at that. And also for our Australian viewers, Shell Australia have got a wonderful competition running where you have the chance to possibly join us at this year's Queensland 500. Welcome back to the West for round six of the championship. Earlier in the week, Craig Lowndes celebrates his, what was it, 47th birthday? No, he's 27. We're not going to sing happy birthday. He's with the Mayor of Perth. Congratulations, Craig Lowndes, on your birthday. And uh, let's see what he can produce today. He'll start seventh on the grid for this race one of three. Sprint race format. Totally different deal. And here's the way they line up on the Shell Helix scoreboard. Paul Radisich has pole. It's an all Ford front row seating alongside him. Then Paul Morris, the first of the Holdens. Russell Ingall, Mark Scaife, Larry Perkins, a good performance in the shootout for sixth. Craig Lowndes, seventh, and Greg Murphy for Kmart eighth. Just a reminder, Craig Lowndes has not been beaten here in V8 Supercar. Could that change this weekend? Jason Bright still struggling with that HRT Commodore just outside the... Oh, actually in 10th position, Cameron McConville just outside the top 10, 11, Bargwana in 12th, Stephen Johnson, winner on the streets of Canberra, he's back in 14th, Paul Wheel up inside the top 20. Mark Larkham having a difficult weekend with the ICS Ford. Marcus Ambrose had a misfire throughout practice qualifying and the shootout. It's been costly. He's down in 18th. 
Richards, Ellery, Bernard, Jason Richards from New Zealand, then John Faulkner and Tony Longhurst is 24. Anthony Tratt and Bradley Jones start out of 26. Trevor Ashby and Paul Romano, the holding young line, back in 28th. Rodney Forks and Cameron McLean having problems in qualifying 30th. Tony Ricciardello, a local, driving Mike Embry's car in 31st. And Daniel Miller, another lad from Perth, he's out of 32. Paul Romano has been pushed away from the grid, as you can see in the background in the Holden Young Lions entry car number 24. So he hasn't been able to take his position on the warm-up lap as we go on board with Marcus Ambrose, one of six competitors carrying on-board cameras for us this weekend. Ambrose has three cameras on board. Here's Mark Scape with the VB camera. Reigning champion, car. Mark's talking about before the race. He was just saying everyone's struggling for grip out there. Just can't quite get it handling the way he wants it. Paul Radisic, Shell Helix in-car camera. Pole position. Second pole position since Simmons Plains in 1999. Four cameras on board for Greg Murphy from New Zealand. Carrying the camera for Kmart. Murph and here's Greg Lowndes, the man who has been unbeaten here in his V8 supercar career. And he's got his work cut out for him this afternoon. He's back in seventh place. And keep in mind, there's no pit stops here where the Gibson Motorsport King team can do the usual leapfrog. He's going to have to fight it out from the front. Air is 21 degrees, and that temperature is actually dropping a little at the moment. By comparison to practice qualifying and the shootout, this is the first time that we've actually seen cloud cover, and that will have some impact on the balance of the cars. Russell Ingle there taking position and the word hum, comes through that Paul Romano has some sort of a gearbox failure with the young lion the A Sports entry and they're now wheeling him into pit lane. The so first, first corner here is going to be fun and games and it? it's uh... so dominant in fact. I'll just get that in a minute. We check on the Ford race analysis of Barbagallo. 320 lap races. 48 kilometres the distance for each. 32 starters. Qualifying. Look at that. One second covering first to 22nd on the grid. Last year's winner, of course, was Craig Lowndes, who started out of seventh today. As you were saying, Neil, probably being on the left-hand side of the road in the first quarter, it's not a bad idea, is it? It's not bad because you get a clean race line. We've got a green flag. The tail enders will start on the corner, the final corner. Revs build. Five seconds is the signal. Radisich makes a great oh, jump great away start. from Seaton. Morris goes with him for second, and Ingle will go down the inside as well. It's a tardy start from Glenn Seaton, who gets squeezed back out to fourth. Radisich off in a blinder. Yeah, Seaton, the better he start last year, if you remember, he went on the grass and knocked his spoiler off, didn't he? See if we get a clean start. That first turn has always been troublesome in the past. Looks like everyone's got through cleanly. 32 cars heading up the hill for the first time. One of the Valvoline cars really crossed up on the run to turn four. Wide of the race line here, it's very marbly and dirty. There's obviously a lot of sand around the location here. It blows onto the circuit, and because it's abrasive, it tends to knock the tyres around, and they uh, they leave marbles. There they are on the outside of uh, turn six down there at Cold Corner. Well, big, right. in, big improver this weekend is Paul Morris. He's Start to show some form on the streets of Canberra. Now he's followed on in WA second. Fast out of the box, got the jump on Glenn Seaton. Finds himself second behind the shell fort as they swing onto the pit straight for the first time. Oh, look at this Ambrose down inside. John Bell almost. So nice clean start so far. Here's the queue as they come across the line. It's Radisic, Morris, Ingle, Glenn Seaton, Mark Scape, Larry Perkins, Greg Murphy in there too. Craig Lowndes, Todd Kelly, Jason Bright rounding out the top ten. Uh, you really can't afford to get off line, can you? See Ingle there, the back end of his thing hanging out. It's really dirty, dusty off line. The other thing that happens, Barry, is the cars drag dirt up when they get wide on the curbing yeah. here. And that means the guy behind gets covered in rubbish and uh, obviously loses grip. Standing lap time for Radisich was a 63.1. He was 0.5 quicker than Morris in the opening lap. On board with Ingle from row two. Look at the wheel spin that Seaton gets, and then he quickly tries to cover, but it's not quick enough. Morris up the inside, Ingle up the inside. Oh. Glenn gets shuffled back out to fourth, and a little rattle on the door just for good measure. So Paul Radisson just pumped it out of car length or two over Morris in third. Russell Ingle in there. And Seaton, Mark Scaife. Larry Perkins, good start from the veteran. He's up in sixth. You see the... Uh, shot there as they came through the final corner of Scape coaxing the car around turn seven as Stephen Johnson, the last round winner, tries to go up the inside of 
Paul Wheel with John Bow on the outside of him, and it's pretty slippery out there, JB. I was talking to Stephen Johnson earlier in the weekend, and he said, yeah, it's been great to win Canberra, but he said, what we have to do, what this team has to do is get some consistency in our performance. This has been so up and down, the speed and the performance of these shell forwards throughout the year. They really need to get some consistency, particularly to their chassis. They're going to mount a strong challenge for the championship. Tyres will be discussed in earnest all weekend because this place being abrasive, it's the first time that this control tyre has been used at this track. Last year, the new tyre that we now have was introduced after this round for the Clipsal 500. So many teams having to fiddle with their setups in order to get the sweet spot right. Look at the black clouds off in the distance here. And the sun can be very bad in the braking area as you go into turn seven here. And Seaton now being attacked by Ingle, uh, by Scape. Well, we said in the driver's briefing from the driving standards observer, Colin Bond, they'll tolerate a little bit of blocking, but if a driver continually dies down the inside line, they'll be shown the bad sportsmanship flag, so Seek have to watch it. The officials will be watching him. This tight battle, it's only a 20-minute sprint. Every position crucial. The temperatures are in the last half an hour drop down two or three degrees that's going to play right into the guy's hands that uh, are really strong but everybody's struck every tires and that this has been a really hot race and the two races tomorrow have been really, so later on uh, really hot uh, they've been strong oh sorry just but dropped the wheel off the edge and it's brought a lot of dust up as they came out of the bottom corner at cold corner turn six skate looking threatening trying to make ground under brakes as they come into the final corner that next bunch is pretty tight as well it contains well, who have you got in there? Perkins, Murphy, Lowndes, Kelly. Radisic is doing it nicely at the moment. 2.3 seconds, the gap he's built on Paul Morris. He's the fastest man on the track. A 58.56, the fastest lap so far for the Shell Ford driver. Remember, this round does not involve compulsory pit stops. It's a square fight to the end. 20-minute races, three of them. And what you've got, you've got to fight with. Trent's been shown a black flag, car number 75, the passenger's door, it keeps flapping open. So obviously he made contact with somebody in the opening lap or laps, and the door isn't fastened, so he's going to have to come in and solve it. Here is Mark Scape having a look up the inside of Glenn Seaton. This time he's got a better run. Glenn's had a tardy run coming out. Mark just looks across. He's got him too. Cleaned him up on the climb out of cold turn. Pretty good to get a run out of there. Look at this battle here, though. Lowndes oh. is going to go up the inside. Oh, oh it's big yeah, contact. Man. Big hit in the front uh, left guard for Lowndes. Well, it wasn't anybody's fault with that, was it? It was just a uh, luck of the draw. And Kmart car fights back to hold position. And if, if that made contact with the front left wheel, then it will inevitably have made uh, some damage on the Lowndes car, maybe changed the toe angles in the front left. We'll try and get a look on the outside of the Lowndes car on the can. The Shell Helix replay of the Anthony Track situation. Left door. Yeah. yeah. So can't drive around with the door flapping in the breeze like that, so he's going to have to bring that in and get that fixed. Waving to the crowd, it's one for yes and two for no. Meanwhile, back on board with Craig Lowndes. This is the classic indication of the old racing format, the 20-minute sprint. Once weather. you get stuck back in the queue, you really pay a penalty. And look at this battle now. Russell Ingalls got plenty of speed on board. The Castrol Commodore has oh, a sniff on the yes, inside of Paul Morris. Not quite Thank close you. enough. Morris wants to fight. They're going to argue as they go down the pitch straight, but Paul Morris gets good acceleration out of the turn of the main straight. He moves across to cover his line, and Russell Ingle gets his nose shut off. He gave him a little bit of a tap down there in the final corner. He's giving him another little love bite just as they go through turn one. It's starting to become, I think, Neil, you say, the cork in the bottle. A few cars starting to bunch up behind Paul Morris now with a big cab racer. And when you start to struggle here, it's because your rear tyres go away. That's what was happening with Glenn Seaton. Yeah, he got a bad it. run coming out of turn six. And it looks like Morris has got the same disease with his car at the moment. If you started with a car that was squarely or neatly balanced and turning well and inevitably goes away from you here, you almost have to have another setting for the race to be gentle on the rear tyres. So cars are starting to queue up behind the big Kev racer. Let's have a look at the replay of the Lowndes incident. You might see the contact here. Oh, Boof. That big from inside, doesn't it look like a bigger impact from the outside? Yes, got it. So got an angle down the inside of Paul Morris, who's starting to struggle now. And Scape's going to have a run at him as well. And Scape's got a better run off the final corner, and he'll try and crisscross him at the other end. But Morris is awake up, covers his ground well. 
Seaton still a watching brief in behind in fifth. Perkins, Murphy, Lowndes, Kelly, Bright, McConville, Barguana, Johnson, the last round winner, 13th, then Tander, Wheel, Bow, Ambrose, Stephen Richards, Ellery and Bernard. That's your top 20 with Larkham just outside. Well, Radisic, look at the time starting to slip now. He's at the low 59s. Everyone else in the 60-second bracket. This is what Mark Scaife forecast very early on in race one. He thought the times would pump out to the minutes. Six-second six lead he's got, which is uh, pretty good, isn't it? Scaife's uh, really threatening. You can hear Mark just paddling the throttle a little bit through turn four and five over the top of the hill. He's just waiting for the car to settle down, waiting for the rear of the car just to sit so that he can get some drive into it. He'll look under brakes down here once again. It's an uphill brake, and Morris yes. leaves room, and he's up there. Former teammates, Paul Morris and Mark Scaife. Morris, of course, joined the Holden Racing team a couple of years back. Helped Mark Scaife and to that strong result in the Shell Championship Series. He's on his own now in the big cab car, hard under brakes as they come up to turn one, but not able to fight back on the Holton Racing Team driver. It was a smart move from Morris because given the fact that he knew that he was starting to struggle a little bit by not running the defensive line, it takes a bit of the pressure out of the situation and therefore not as likely to get a whack in the tail and spun off and can hold at least a strong position, whereas if you dispute sometimes when your car's going away from you, particularly early in the race, it's a high risk game that you're playing because you can end up in the weeds. Gotta say it's the most outstanding performance from this Queensland based team. They haven't been in V8 supercar racing very long. Got a quite an experienced crew, Arch McMurray, one of the veterans of touring car racing in Australia, preparing the engines, and Paul Sepernich, the man who worked with the Stone Brothers operation last year, is now on board as chief engineer. And keep in mind, they're still running the ex Holden Racing Team Commodore, their first in-house built car is yet to come. Seating up the inside and makes the move, and Larry will go with him, and the Kmart uh -huh. cars are in there as well. So Morris is really losing rear grip on this car at the moment. And oh, getting, this I've got the cross. Oh, he's under siege, isn't Getting he? shuffled down the order. There's a queue of them, and they'll box his ears and all run through the inside. Lowndes is in there as well. So Paul Morris just losing positions. Hand over fist. Here comes the Kmart car. He wants to argue as they come up through the S's, but he has to give way. That car really struggling for rear end grip now. Well, he's been sensible about it. At least he's not um, getting in everybody's way. Well, he's letting people pass. As, he's as, battling as hard yeah. as he can, but once you once you find yourself getting shoved and elbowed by the pack, they just they'll maul you. The hardest thing to come to terms with in these cars is running a soft suspension setup, which they seem to like. Morris's car obviously performing very well in qualifying trim, but under race conditions, just giving the tyres too much of a hard time. 51 is Murphy, then it's Perkins, then Lowndes, then Kelly, there's Morris, and he's got Bright all over him, making a move down the inside now, and Bright will look for some space going to turn one. Morris is just squeezing across. It's all happening now as we get into the second half of this race. Round six of the championship, race one, Radisish. Big margin, look at it, eight seconds over Inglescape, Seaton, Murphy, Perkins, Lowndes and Kelly. Paul Morris, Jason Bright round out the top ten. More from Barbagello Raceway on Network 10. Last lap is the margin, Radisich to Ingle. He's out there on his own. Look at that gap in the background. It's forever. And there's Ingle, and Scaife's just got a watching station there at the moment, but it looks like it's settled down, Barry. Yeah, you look at Radisich, his time is 0.6 of a second, 6 tenths of a second quicker than anyone, which is massive. Bright and Morris in vigorous dispute for a minor placing here. It's ninth and 10th, and uh, Bright really looking for every opportunity. Barguana behind him, who was quick in practice early. Then Stephen Johnson. Cameron McConville is the next man, just a couple of car lengths back then. Wheel, John Bow and Stephen Richards. That gives you an idea of the layout. Turns one, two, three. The left-hander into turn four. Positive camber, uphill corner. A blind brow for five. It's a fabulous shot. Gives you an idea of the layout of the circuit. And given the Saturday race, a very big crowd here. You look at the, some of the guys low down the ferries. Uh, Bernard in 20th, Ettery oh. in 19th, Ambrose. Look at that. Larry Perkins way offline on the entry to Colt Corner. Craig Lowndes could see him drifting wide. Took advantage. Gibson Motorsport car picks up another spot. Just listening to the, just listening to the radios, it doesn't seem to be anybody's complaining. Too much of tyre wear at the moment. Talking to the Bridgestone boys, they say this is the slipperiest track we go to because of the road base. And they're now finding that the, the rocks in the road base are all rounded off so it's so slippery but tyre wear will be a problem because of those same rocks it's just tearing strips how much will they have at the end of the race we're only going to know when that comes around Paul Radisic is beautifully positioned at the front there he's 9.5 seconds he's demolishing this field he's obviously very very comfortable and he's just being able to drive a nice straight conservative line as well to protect those tyres looking from the back of Craig Lowndes car he's in sixth at the moment 
was the 27 year old at work <laughs> old bloke didn't he we used to we used to call him the kid only a few years ago four millimeters is the tread depth with these bridgestone control tires and there's tread depth indicators on both sides of the tire and uh, everybody will be having a long hard look at the left rear in particular here corners like this are the ones that do the damage a lot of horsepower going through the left hand corner of the car climbing the hill 600 horsepower don't forget to check out the v8 supercar website and that address is www for the world wide web v8 supercar.com.au lots of details about the series the drivers the teams and also check out while you're online dreamdrive.tv it's a fabulous game to play if you haven't already looked at that site then i'd recommend you do so and you can oh! Big way down in turn one. Locked up, got it all wrong. Something weird has happened there. That was a dr dramatic yeah, exit look, from the track, wasn't it? I wonder if something's broken yeah, on that car. Like the, I don't know whether my imagination looked like the front left had already turned in. Mm. When it, I'd like to see that again in yeah. slow-mo. Well, uh, did someone mention before that I think he had a little bit of a rub with one of the other guys a bit earlier, so maybe something's broken, but it certainly looked like an unusual way. I mean, Larry doesn't make those sorts of mistakes traditionally. And the battle at the front, Mark Scafers, his teammate Jason Bright, but up front, Scafers just closing the gap to Ingle. He's within one second of the Castrol Commodore. Paul Radisic has bolted 9.7 seconds. He's almost got that lead out to over 10 seconds now over Ingle. This is the battle, a bit further back in the pack. Jason Bright in 10th spot. And Johnson, classic example of what he was talking about, about the inconsistency of his car's performance this year. It just goes up and down like a yo-yo. Let's have a look at this Larry Perkins situation. Larry was having a look down the inside. No, I think he might just have right oh, lock yeah, on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a bit of under <laughs> He was uh, right under the tail of the Kmart car and maybe just missed his braking marker. And uh, he's oh, a long way. He's got a very deep at Wanneroo Beach. And here we are. This is the battle for second place between Russell Engel and Mark Scaife. Scaife's just been chipping away at it. Tenth of a second here. Tenth of a second there. And he's right on the back of the Castrol car now as they come out of the sweeper and punch up this hill once again. Five laps remaining for our race leader, Paul Radisic. At second place, the battle for that is not over yet. It's a return to form for Russell after having a difficult Canberra. Of course, he was strong up in Darwin, and then he had some unreliability problems. Scaife's right with him. You notice that Mark's been glancing in the mirror occasion because, occasionally because he's got Seaton behind him. We've got five to go as they cross the line this time. First time Paul Radisic has done a 60-second lap. It's at 60.12. He's been running around in the low to mid-59s for the first part of the race. So everyone now pumping out to the 60-second bracket, but it's over. Look at the look at the lead that Radisic it's out to 10.4 seconds. He's been building at least half a second on this field every lap. Bad sportsmanship flag has just been shown to Morris, car number 29. He's in front of a pack of cars that involves Johnson and Bright. And Bright's actually lost the place to Johnson. So uh, something going on back there. And Morris, if he continues to offend, will be brought in. Look at Scaife. Oh, he's given him a little tag. Russell's wide of the line. Oh. And he was very gingerly on the throttle. So hard to get power to the ground with both these run. cars. This is just like ice skating, isn't it? Trying yeah. to get 600 horsepower to the ground. The car's sliding every way. Look at this attack now under brakes. Scaife what is that awful? moves over. Hard under brakes. Takes second place from Ingle. I think it's just rubber build-up, Barry. Yeah, it's a, just... Um, Ingle wants to argue, short. though. He's got a good run out of the corner onto the pit straight. Scaife's giving him room down the inside, but he's not close enough to attack under brakes. So Scaife takes second spot. You can see how delicately... Oh, oh. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Love to. <laughs> you can see how delicately you have to use the throttle around this track, particularly when the grip's gone away from the rear of the car. That bottom corner turn six where you come out of the gully, it's so difficult to get the cars to grip there and you just can't drive them like a racing car. You've got to be so... It's like driving in the wet. Well, look at way offline here. You look at the, the rubber and stuff when you get offline. I mean, it's history. This too. is the corner that really knocks the left rear tyre around and this is the one where Russell was weak that last time through. Watch this as they drive out of here. Look who's got the better. Look at Scaife. Just opening up yeah, one or two metres on him just under power. That's where, you, that's where you find it. Just a little bit better drive coming out of that corner. And it's a fabulous run down the hill. It's a roller coaster ride over the brow into the braking area. The braking area is uphill. Here are the margins. There's Seaton. Further back, it's Murphy, then Lowndes, Martin, then Kelly, right. then Morris. Radis has got 12.1 12 12 seconds now. He's just been pulling out something like a half a second to a second a lap. So whatever that he's discovered in setup land, yeah. cool. I think everybody else would like a dose of it. Working a treat. He's doing it so effortlessly. Back in the 59s as well, a 59.87 for the race leader. Everyone behind him, 60 second bracket or higher. So this car 
working particularly well around here. Not nearly as so impressive from his teammate Stephen Johnson, who's struggling around the back of the top ten. And it'll only be subtle, Mark. That it'll, yeah. be, it'll be just a little difference here and there. Maybe they've got a ride height difference, a shock absorber setting, maybe fraction of uh, different spring rate, whatever. But it can be just enough sometimes. But Radis has just got his car working like a dream. His last lap through was a 59.8. He's the only person in the 59s, and we're well into the closing stages of this race. Paul Radisich currently 14th in the Shell Championship Series points with only two laps remaining. Paul Morris continuing to fight on now. He falls into the clutches of Stephen Johnson. Headlights on. Look at that rubber build-up Barry was talking yeah. about at the brow of the hill. Just destroying the tyres around here. Morris now fighting a rearguard action. Johnson is in ninth position. Morris is in eighth. And Jason Bright is tenth. Look, can Johnson find a way past this big Kev racer before this race is over? Two laps remaining. Very dark outside yeah. now. I think they'll get through with just two laps to run, a little less for the leader now, but uh, certainly the threat of showers in the late afternoon. Look at this. And Paul's got the elbows high. He's had a good showing today. He doesn't want to yield positions unnecessarily, and Stephen's applying the blowtorch. You get the feeling something's going to happen down at the sweeper here. Oh, look at this. So often the car with tyres in slightly better condition can pounce, particularly on the exit. They get a sharper bite at the apex of the turn, a little bit more speed coming out. Oh, a little bit of a lock up. Look, yeah. at, look, at, look at Junior now setting up for a big attack on the way out. Morris just, just pitched the front right a little bit when it was unloaded going into the braking area. He might be fractionally stronger coming off, but it's not like he's got a car that's massively quicker at the moment than Morris. He's got a little bit of an edge on him, but it's hard to find a way around when cars are relatively equally matched. Paul Morris has set off on his final lap. This is the battle isn't over yet. This is for... Paul Morris in eighth, Johnson in ninth, Bright in tenth. It's been so much of a story of this year for Jason Bright since he's taken over this new Holden Racing Team Commodore. His car just has been so uncooperative in terms of setup. It's been a real mind bender for the team trying to figure out just what it is this car needs. Every time they put it on the track early in the weekend, it's, it's just so far from where they want to be. And then he has to work, work, work all through the weekend trying to get it dialed in. Here's our race leader and dominant winner 13 seconds the gap Paul Radisich has over the field he's murdered him great run from Radisich and the shell team is absolutely slaughtered the pack in round six race one it's a huge margin and we're still waiting for second place to arrive at the final corner congratulations to Radisich and here's the battle it'll be Mark Scape the championship leader Russell Ingle in hot pursuit in third and the gap at the end 12.7 seconds then Seaton Murphy Lowndes, Kelly will be next. The dispute is going to be resolved in favour of Morris. Paul Morris with Hang Stephen on. Johnson, then Jason Bright, who lost a place in that little battle. Gap then back to Barguana, McConville, then Bow, big margin back to Stephen Richards, Ellery, Paul Wheel, Tony Longhurst, Marcus Ambrose, then Cameron McLean, David Bernard, Mark Lark, and Brad Jones. And then Garth Tander, followed by Rodney Forbes, and there is our race winner. And it all looks pretty cool and comfortable for Paul oh, no, no. How easy is that when you're out in front and you've got the setup right on the car, Neil? Be cruising Sunday drive, or Saturday drive, I should say. <laughs> and that puts him in a great position for the second race. The order of the results in this event will determine the starting order for the second race. It's just so typical of the domination we've seen from Craig Lowndes here over the years with the Holden Racing Team cars. Just so quick in qualifying, and then the races start, it's just get a good start. See you later. It's the first time for a while that we haven't seen this HRT Lounge domination of recent years. And here's the way they finish. 12.7 seconds, Radish used to escape. Ingle, Seaton, Murphy, Lounge, Kelly and Morris, the top eight. Stephen Johnson and Jason Bright rounded out the top ten. Bagwana McConville well placed in 12. John Bow up to 13. Stephen Richards, Stephen Ellery and Paul Will round out the top 16. Then there was this tight battle between Longhurst, Ambrose, McLean, Bernard, Larkham, Jones, Tander and Forbes. Trevor Ashby and Daniel Miller, the local, 26, John Faulkner, Jason Richards, Tony Riccadelli, getting down to the DNFs. More after the break. Thumbs up and a big smile from Paul Radisich. He has reason to be very happy cleaning up the first race by one heck of a margin, 12.7 seconds, and there's the Shell Helix race score. Radisich, Scaife, Ingle, Seaton. Some notables, Stephen Johnson qualified 14th, moved up to 9th. Cameron McLean qualified 30th and moved to 19th. And poor old Larry Perkins back there in 31st, in actual fact, uh, did not finish because Larry ended up beached down there on the outside of Turn 1, an unhappy time for him. But certainly not the case for Paul Radisich. He was thrilled and he's with Grant Denyer.
Well, Paul Radisich from pole to a win, it really does help when you start at the front, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. It makes light work of it. And um, I think Johnson team has done a fantastic job. You know, uh, we've worked very hard on these cars to make them competitive and um, really starting to show uh, what it's capable of. So with this track, you just got to start up front. And, um, you know, Paul Morris made my life a lot, a lot easier today. But um, that's what happens when you start at the front. How's that winning margin? We thought that would be the last thing that would happen here. What? Oh, sorry, I missed that. I said, how about that winning margin? We thought that would be the last thing that would happen here. Well, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, who knows? It's motorsport, you know. Some days they go really well. And I, I, I was, you know, the other guys were racing and I just had a clear track. And around here, if you've got a clear track, it, you know, you're able just to drive your own, um, your own race. Well, that looks so slippery on the track. We've got to ask you, how much tyre do you think you have left? Well, I was, I was you know, saying to the guys, how far back are they in the game? You know, 10, 11, 12, slopping back. I think, gee, if I'm having trouble, they must be too. So it is very abrasive, and uh, tyre wear is, is a real problem. It's just a matter of conserving them as best you can. Well done, Paul. We've got another two to go. Absolutely. Thanks. Cheers. And a very big crowd for the first race. We only just squeaked home before some what would have been pretty ordinary weather for those guys. It would have stopped the race. Very cloudy and the potential for showers. But, you know, we talk a lot about the officials in V8 supercar racing in the commentary box here. Sometimes we give them a bad time. Sometimes we give them a tick. So who's making the tough calls in the V8 supercar paddock? Well, Greg Rust is going to take us on a tour of Official Central. In just about every sport, the umpire is seen as a bad guy or a bit of a mug. They've got the most toughest and unenviable job in the world, and sometimes they get it wrong. It doesn't matter whether it's AFL, rugby league or motor racing. All the competitors want is some consistency with decisions. So who's making all the big calls in the V8 Supercar Paddock? Come on, we'll introduce you to them now. Red flag, red flag. This is race control, the nerve centre of the entire operation. Just about every piece of communication from marshals and officials right around the circuit is relayed through this point. At the top of our chain of command, if you like, is ex-Formula 1 driver and race director Tim Schenken. Now, Tim is basically the top dog, if you like, of V8 supercar officialdom. He works closely with the clerk of the course or race manager at each round. Tim's decisions are on start procedure, for example, and whether someone may have jumped the start. He's responsible for calling out the safety car and issuing stop-go penalties and that dreaded black flag, of course. It's also Tim's call to red flag a race if there's been a major incident of some kind. So there's a lot of responsibility resting on Tim's shoulders. Most infringements are dealt with during the course of a race, with an instant penalty, for example, like a stop-go. But if a matter requires further investigation, it comes here to the steward's room. Now, Garth Wigston is the chief steward. He's backed up by Peter Svensson and a local steward, depending upon which track we're at. They're all experienced race drivers, and when it comes to an inquiry, they're assisted by Colin Bond, former Australian touring car champion and Bathurst winner. He's the driving standards observer. Together, they can conduct a thorough video review of an incident with every available angle of footage and they'll consult with the relevant parties too like drivers, team managers and the race director before deciding whether to take any further action. The judges are fact and there's several of them policing pit lane. Their decisions are final. Running this side of the operation, the category's technical manager, Paul Taylor. Operations manager, Ray Robbins, and Steve Brown assist him here as well. These guys are basically keeping an eye on a number of things. Whether there's been any pit lane infringements committed, like speeding, wheel nuts and wheels flying off into the fast lane during a pit stop, etc. And they administer all of the penalties, the on-the-spot ones, like stop goes. With technology and motorsport continuing to expand at a rapid rate, it's important to ensure that no one gets an unfair advantage through the data or engine management side of the business. This is Carl Jacobs. He's a qualified electronics engineer who regularly checks the data loggers in each car. Now, these loggers are independent from the Motec or Tronic systems used by the teams. Carl basically makes sure that no one exceeds the 7,500 RPM limit when they're out on the track, and he's looking for evidence of any kind of traction control devices which are banned. So there you go, that's the very top end of the decision-making process. Obviously the scrutineers and of course the flag marshals have some input in decisions like that. And they're all working to the same common set of rules. Here they are. It's pretty thick, isn't it? Nice little piece of bedtime reading. And like any legal argument, rules like this are always open to interpretation. Thank you, whispering Greg Rust. Greg Rust brings us up to date with what goes on behind the scenes with the officials. Well, throughout the year, we've been going at home with various drivers, and this week it's birthday boy Craig Lowndes' turn. Let's go to the circuit breaker.
Hi, I'm Craig Lowndes. When I'm not racing, I'm sitting here at home on the ranch north of Brisbane. We've got my horse, which is uh, Duffy. He's a quarter horse. He's very, very classic, great for me. Uh, we've got an uh, Anglo-Arab, which is Nat's horse, which is her original horse, Blue. She's in foal. Here comes the little one. This is, this is Sucha, this is Mini Moo. This is the one we keep talking about. She's probably more the pets. She's the one that comes into the house. And uh, the others, just as you can see, just roam around the garden, eat my plants. Come in. Probably after the race round, you're looking at two to three days, just getting back to all the emails and all the fans that write to Craig. Generally, he lays down on the floor and just uh, half falls asleep and answers my questions, and I just type away. And some of the questions are, you know, you know Craig, will you marry me? <laughs> How do you answer those ones, Natalie? Um, generally, I say he's got a girlfriend, Minnie Moo, and uh, a wife that sits at home. And <laughs> well, these are the two Yamahas, and the only thing I've done to this is uh, pull the mufflers out of the exhaust because it's got to sound fat. To come home and just feed the animals and, and really just mingle with them when you get home, it sort of just brings you back uh, away from that scene. And, uh, you know, we love it here. Should we do a horsepower gag? I don't think so. We're coming back with race two from Perth very shortly. Stay with us, you're on 10, your home of motorsport.